<laughs> you know they say about monkeys and typewriters. <laughs> Never forget that you have the tools to build a life on your own terms. Forget the haters. This is Founder Quest. And thanks to Star, we are now linked on the Honey Badger site. Oh <laughs> yeah, it only took like two years to do that. Oh, I saw that, that on a, on the about page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. That's that's yeah. Cool. I don't know what made me think about it. I was just, I don't know, surfing the site for something. I'm like, you know what? We should probably link to the podcast from our site since. Did yeah. It, thanks for did, opening that issue. I thought we had it in the footer or something. Was it not even in the footer? No. Oh man. We're good at marketing. <laughs> we are so good at marketing. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a good thing. So thank yeah. You, sir. Yeah, no problem. It was good. It's nice to have like a, a tiny, like concrete task that I know I can do. It doesn't like fractally expand into just caverns of uncertainty. For reals. Speaking of caverns of uncertainty, like I was helping a friend with their website, which is a very old, old website. And I, I can't even admit, you know, while recording what versions of various software it's using, because that's how old it is. But basically we needed to make a move. And I was like, you know, the, the last time I touched this, which was like two years ago or something, like even then everything was crusty and old and like, there's no way we're going to find, you know, a new hosting provider that's supporting all this old stuff anymore. So mm -hmm. what to do, what to do. So I was just like, you know what, let me just run wget on the, on the site and just mirror the whole site, to static pages, and then, you know, dump it up somewhere behind the Apache and just leave it that. So, nice. So I sent that over to him. I'm like, hey, you should try this. How about how about this? So we'll see. Like the problem is, you know, there's no search now, and you know, contact forms and stuff like that won't work. I'm like, you know what? Just just let it go. Just you know, embrace yeah. simplicity. So. <laughs> That's so oh weird. God, yeah. That's it's that, that is so weird because like yesterday, I literally did that with the Hey uh, Sales site that oh, was, yeah, yeah. was in Rails. I literally like saved, I did the save as web page thing and, and then like edited the CSS paths and just like dumped it into a GitHub pages uh, branch on the, you know, on the public repository because um, we decided not to sell Heya anymore and release it as open source. And so we didn't need like this fancy Rails app that we were paying to like demo, demo it. So yeah, sometimes just like save as web page and deploy is the way to do way to go. You know, when you mentioned the search, that re that reminded me of this um, client I used to have. Yeah, it was uh, a freelancing client. It's a Rails app. Very, it's a very very old version of Rails. Still, I guess technically they're still my client. I never actually dropped them because like they would get in contact with me with me like once every two years and have me do like two hours of work. So I was just like, okay, whatever. It's it's mostly because I like them and I just don't want to. I know that they're not going to find somebody who's going to do this for them. So I, I didn't want to leave them high and dry. But um, I built a um, like export as PDF feature a long time ago for them. And it used, what was it? What was a headless browser? Fan, was it Phantom? Uh, yeah, Phantom. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it used a headless browser to like save as a PDF or print as a PDF or whatever. And um, it was all in Heroku. And, you know... Last year, they, they got in touch with me and was like, so this PDF thing stopped working. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because I haven't touched this in like almost 10 years, like this part. So I was just like, you know, like all browsers support like print to PDF now. Like all operating <laughs> systems just have, you just press print and then you put, you do the PDF, you select PDF and it works. I that's, remember trying to get fix. them just to do that the first time I built it. But um, Windows didn't have that feature. You had to have like a... Project um, driver for that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you had to yeah. have a special software. Mm -hmm. So, but this time, I guess Windows added print to PDF, so it was okay. Nice. That's that's amazing. Did it? Yeah. What did it use? A WK HTML to PDF? Is that what? It, or was it something else? I think that used no, a headless it was browser. A, oh, okay, so you were. Yeah, it was. It was like a headless browser that. Um, so you were would doing it. Okay. To PDF, it was running on Heroku somehow. I don't know yeah. how I got it to run on Heroku. So Ben, ben remembers. Uh, what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, that was painful. <laughs> On Heroku, even, I think. Um, I remember specifically an issue with that where, uh, like, I think we were, like, deploying it to Heroku and it had, like, some PDF function like this, but we weren't, we weren't paying for, like, multiple dinos or something. 
it would have these like random, uh, like the app was having these random failures where it would just like not respond to requests. And it turns out that the reason was that it was like, it was being blocked by this PDF process in the background. And then it would just like block the threads for like connections to, uh, you know, unicorn or whatever it was, whatever server it was using, probably WebKit or something or what uh, web brick yeah so yeah the, the the solution to that problem was just to uh pay for <laughs> pay for hosting <laughs> so your scale you're saying is this wasn't like a uh, high availability high scalability setup <laughs> no <laughs> but i think it was for a client so like they were extremely cheap so <laughs> i was like yeah. you just you just need to put some money into this that's a catch-22 with freelancing <laughs> because like you can be working on a thing and be, just be like, this is terrible. I would be embarrassed yeah. to show anybody this, but nobody's going to pay you to make it any better. So, <laughs> I mean, you're just not because you got to make a living. That's the like phase of freelancing where you just need to eat. Yeah. 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 That's a terrible phase. Much better when you can get to the point where you can be selective in your clients and, you know, pick ones that'll actually both pay you and pay for the things that you recommend they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of my uh, like last old, old, old clients recently switched their website like you were talking about, Ben. I do remember the software versions they were running until very like semi, like within the last couple of years, I think they were running a Joomla 1.0 site, which was like, I think the last release of that was like 2008 or something. <laughs> this was Maybe also 2000- a Joomla site. Yeah, it's, it's like got to be a Joomla site if it was like from the like the late aughts or whatever. Right. So, yeah, good times. Uh, I don't know. Like it must have been hacked like 75 different ways. I, or right. if I don't know how it wasn't, to be honest. But I advised them to move to Squarespace, which um, I was looking at actually for a personal project recently because I was like looking at like, do I want to build a custom like a custom, you know, little HTML site or whatever. And I realized like for Squarespace, it's like $140 a year for like just to deploy a basic website. That's just like for most like small business, you know, like clients that I used to, like I started out with like in the early 2000s or whatever, like that job just shouldn't exist anymore. (laughs) Like it should just, it's just Squarespace or the services like them that, I mean, it's, you get a decent website that is maintained and it's like an hour of a like modern developer's time per year. It just doesn't make sense to roll it myself. It's a little bit sad because um, like one of my favorite aspects of web development was always just getting some mock-up from a designer or getting like a, a screen from a designer. And then you have to like make it somehow work using 2009 era CSS. And it sounds very masochistic, but it's like once you get into it, it's just a very like Zen type thing because it's like, it just is what it is. You're just... You're just moving pixels from one picture to another, in one window to another yeah. on the computer. Like, it's just, I, I don't know. That was kind of well, fun, yeah. Yeah, very. I never got into that. Uh, that was always, for me, very frustrating. So I just I just farmed that out to chop shops. Who would I remember chop. that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, was, that was so awesome. I was so glad to find those services. They just, yeah, you give them a whatever PSD, PSD and they give, and they give, they give you give back you. the CSS yeah. and the HTML. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they took no pride in their work, Ben. <laughs> well, that's, that's maybe. the thing that always got me. Like I always get so mad. Like this HTML is just garbage. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just held my nose and ran with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's like all the same to the browser. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking yesterday about doing a, uh, like a, uh, just a website for personal stuff. It's not, it's not related to work, but, um, and I was just like, what, what would be like the, easiest for me to do but like the least maintenance and i was just like maybe i just like do like a do like an ascii doc document like one ascii doc document and publish it on netlify Mm -hmm. and you'd have to set up the the build to you know to build the the ascii doc but i mean that seems pretty that seems like it wouldn't require any maintenance i would probably go with github pages for that Instead of Netlify, I kind of actually because I'm a yeah. little peeved at Netlify today. Because <laughs> yesterday when I was working on this project for my my friend, like I was like, oh, I'll just do it on Netlify. Uh, no, no, because like for one, this I've got you know buckets of HTML HTML files that I'm just trying to send over to Netlify, right? So I just you know drag and drop like they say you can do. It's fine, and then it's like deploying and deploying 
and deploying. I'm like, 20 minutes later, it's still deploying. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is just, I mean, it's a few hundred HTML files. Give me a break, right? And so I'm like, so I go into the deploy logs, see what it's doing. It's analyzing each HTML file and, and spitting out errors about all the references to <laughs> non-secure assets. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, I, I, it's, it's a web page, right? Just, just serve the web page, right? And, but, <laughs> and then, you know, I was like, well, let me put this on a separate team because I don't want it on my stuff. And then Netlify is like, oh, no, you're already part of a paid team. You can't start a new free thing. Sorry, you're just out of luck. And I'm like, fine, I'll just go to DreamHost. Like, <laughs> I've been with DreamHost for 20 years. They know how to host websites. <laughs> I yeah, just like, did it. SFTP, <laughs> I whipped out transmit. I did a copy real quick and like, boom, it just works. I'm like, there you go. Like, that's all I needed. I just needed you to render some stinking web pages. It and goes, like, it, it goes very hosts. well with, uh, with like save from web <laughs> or whatever. Exactly. Save, save as website. Exactly. <laughs> so, Is there, can we like name this like a lamp? It's like the, you got the lamp stack. You've got, uh, you've got, what are the other stacks? I don't well, know. There's the jam stack. There's oh, yeah. jam stack. There's the yeah. mean stack. If you're into Mongo, Express, Angular, and I can't remember what the end was now. So we're going to have, it's going to be Save from Web. It's going to be <laughs> DreamHost. And I don't know. We're going to have to put a, a referral link for DreamHost in the show notes. So like yeah, I can get some it's mad money be, credits on this. Yeah, include your maybe, referral. Um, <laughs> HTML. Wait, no, it's going to have, <laughs> DreamHost is going to be running Apache probably. Yep. So it's going to be SDA stack. SDA. 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 Yeah. I mean, you can run Lamb stuff on DreamHost. They do PHP and they have like a one click yeah. WordPress install. So it's like, it's so easy. It's four bucks a month, right? And, and can, can I just say, say some, one thing, a control panel? Control panel. There you right? go. I mean, like, what else do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the one problem with DreamHost though. And the one thing that really just gets my goat. If they would do this one thing, then I'd be so happy with them. But because they ha it's a shared hosting model, it's really cheap. You know, they, of course, they oversell it and stuff. And so your IP address can change at any time, like because they're rotating Apache things and all the kind of stuff, right? So you have to have your DNS hosted with them because they're going to be changing your, your web server periodically. You mm -hmm. can't have your DNS elsewhere. And that's just, just kind of a bummer. But, you know, as long as you're okay with having your DNS hosted by DreamHost, it's great. It's four bucks a month. You just throw some web pages up there and it works. I love it. What about like dynamic DNS or, or something like that? I remember I that from back in the day? I, uh, yeah. <laughs> All the wacky oh, things. Do you think there are like Back young me. people that listen to this podcast that have like no idea what we've been talking about for the past 10 minutes, like control Probably. panel? And I just think it's, it's really funny that, that like somebody like, like is waxing poetic about cPanel. Or you see, yes. <laughs> this is just such a, it's such a weird, like cyclical moment. It's like, I feel like we've completed the circle. It's like, you know, you start out like 10 years ago, 15 years of being like, oh, this sucks. You know, I need to yeah. I need terminal access and you do everything with the terminal. And then, you know, you, you eventually move on and it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm using Ansible now. We're going to have an everything scripted. <laughs> and then finally, it's just like, you know what? I could like, you know, what has scripting of things. Cpanel. I'm just going to press that <laughs> button and not worry about it. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, serverless is just CGI bin. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. But do not so want to go back to the Pearl though. CGI PM was horrible you're making me like um you're making me reconsider netlify then so maybe we'll just go straight to s3 we'll just build that locally yeah, just totally. upload it to s3 and be done one thing i was i've been really surprised at a couple of netlify things like you would think that would be like really just features that they would have that they don't i guess um like one is like you can't just tell it to like rebuild my site every day because which oh yeah yeah like it seems like it uh Okay, first of all, maybe that seems like a very specific weird request, but um, if you're using Netlify, chances are you're using a static site generator. And if you ever, ever want to um, schedule posts to be published in the future with the static site generator, you have to rebuild the site. So rebuilding it like once a day just makes sense. So I, I had to do that in, uh, you know, setting up a, a separate, you know, trigger for that, which just seemed weird. And then also like the... I was looking into this because my little like personal site I was thinking about, which which don't worry, it's not like a separate business project. I'm not trying to like like cut you guys out of the you know huge <laughs> with a, huge with revenue an ASCII doc. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just with my ASCII doc, my my rev <laughs> my my huge ASCII doc revenue. It's it's just all about how Honey Badger sucks. I hate working <laughs> here. 
<laughs> Sign a whistleblower. <laughs> It's <laughs> short that honey badger. It's your stuff. diary, your honey badger diary. <laughs> it's like you're just publishing the last ten years of your your inner, innermost thoughts about how much you hate honey, honey badger. <laughs> no, like, it's not that. Star, it's not. <laughs> star comes comes clean. Star. That's all right. <laughs> oh yeah, the other thing, like I was like, okay, I could maybe, you know, this would be an ASCII doc, but maybe I could make it a little bit fancy by just adding some JavaScript to it and make it sort of appear to be a website. Like you have a single ASCII doc that has multiple sections. So maybe like each section sort of appears to be a web page. And really you're just showing and hiding them when you click on links. And so I was like, okay, well that would that would that work with um like you still want people to be able to link directly to the um you know page they're on. And so I was like, you know, I'm sure Netlify has some setting that lets it pass through like um it basically lets it like serve the same HTML page for a variety of paths and then let the, that page's JavaScript decide what to do based on that path. And it, it really doesn't. Um, it just like it lets you d- redirect everything to index. And maybe you could figure out, maybe if, I don't know, maybe like you could figure out from the refer like what page they were on, but that seems pretty like janky for something as like fundamental as like, uh, you know, routing. I think what you, you need is like ASCII doc plus rule. React. You want to rewrite? Do they have and that? a rewrite rule? They might. Apache does. You know, DreamHost has got Apache. Just DreamHost. They have like oh, I don't know DreamHost. if they have rewrites. They I know they have like you, the redirects file, and they might they have, have like some kind of rewrites. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Things I was seeing online were people saying, "Okay, well, you you should make a redirects file that includes every page." on your site and then somehow like redirect. I, I don't know. It yeah. just see, it's all, all seemed very like, just kind of uh, like it was made out of, of duct tape and twigs. I was thinking about that yesterday uh, when I was working on the site. I think I was thinking about your, your GitHub actions thing that does the scheduled calls to Netfly, Netlify to build our site so you can have those scheduled posts. And I was thinking, if you're already going down that path of using GitHub actions to automate something for your site, like just build it there. And then, you know, SFTP it over to DreamHost and you're done. And you can pay four bucks a month instead of 80 bucks a month to Netlify, you know? Oh, there, yeah. I mean, we do, we do the same thing for Hook Relay. Like the, uh, the, the main site has documentation built on our open swagger API annotation stuff that's in our app. So we have this YAML file that specifies all our API endpoints. And then we have some Java thing that renders the uh, that YAML into actual HTML pages, the open swagger renderer or something like that. Well, you know, uh, Netlify doesn't have Java installed. And so so Kevin found this uh, GitHub action that just does that. Right. And so so now instead of just like having Netlify deploy our site like we used to, now we have GitHub actions build the site and then sync it over to, to Netlify. It's like, well, now yeah. we're paying. 80 bucks a month or whatever, just for static, you know, HTML pages. And it's like, that's kind of silly. Yeah. You could yeah. just deploy to S3. I do, yeah. I do like, I do like the fact that you can preview branches. That's nice. That like that's, nice. you could and you could probably do that with GitHub too, right? You could just, but you'd have to figure it out, right? You'd have to like, right. you know, deploy it to different URL or different S3 buckets or whatever, you know, based on the branch name, then you have to like, remember what that scheme was every time you wanted yeah. to. Mm-hmm. It's another like, it's it. just like if you do it, then if you do everything like mostly Netlify's way, it, it all just works. And it's, it's pretty nice for my experience. But if you try to get too unique, get too fancy. then yeah, get too fancy. Yeah. Then there's friction. Yep. All right. So you're all ready to launch Badgelify. <laughs> <laughs> Badgerify. <laughs> We'll just no. take him down. <laughs> no, I'd rather not. Like, <laughs> as, as, what? Because I was working on Hooker Day this week, and I got it. I got it submitted to Heroku to be promoted to a beta add-on, so it would actually show up in the marketplace listings. Because we've done the alpha thing, we've got our documentation in place, we've got our pricing done. You know, we got our paying customer that came on site. Which, <laughs> yay! Thank you very much. And so, anyway, I was working on that this week to get it finished off with Heroku. And now it's, I'm basically just waiting for Heroku to do whatever they do to approve the app to go out so be public. And that's all great. But I was thinking, this is a hassle. Like just building the app is one thing, right? But then you got to like do all these just administrative stuff just to get it mm-hmm. out there. And then, you know, of course, you also have to, you can't forget about the whole marketing and side and, and maybe you want to do some sales even. 
And uh, so I'm like, man, having a having another product, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's I think that's why uh, Josh, you can correct me on this, but I think that's why we just decided to give up on the idea of selling Heya because it's like it's just too much work. Well, to it sell. is a lot of work to. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, the effort, yeah, whatever the the payoff has to be worth the effort, or the effort yeah. has to be worth the payoff. And in the case of Heya, like, I don't know, I think we were we tried it. It was an experiment, and we tried it, and we realized that you know it's probably going to take too much work to actually market it and turn it into something like you know that really makes a difference on the bottom line given our other business or, you know, I think it's still like a lot of people like it. They seem to like it. And I think it has a lot of potential like to grow as an open source product because obviously like that, that opens up like who can use it. There, there are definitely benefits of just releasing it for free. So, and it's a fairly simple, relatively simple project. So yeah, I'm excited to, uh, so I don't, we haven't even announced that it's, I, this was yesterday. We changed the license and released it. So um, oh, we're announcing it now. It's an exclusive. I guess this is, yeah, we're announcing that. Hey, we'll is now free and open notes. source. Everybody go use. Hey, yeah. GPL a 59.95 value. <laughs> I'm looking forward to growing that. Like, you know, we, we talked recently about adding uh, some more features for it for doing broadcast emails. Yeah. I and, still really uh, want to work on it. Yeah, me too. So like one of these Saturdays, I'm definitely going to, you know, when I'm bored, I'm gonna crank. Now that the, it's now that it's a it's a true open source project, you're gonna you're gonna contribute <laughs> some some weekend <laughs> time to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I'm not I'm not anymore philosophically opposed to contributing to it. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can let my open source purity unleashed yeah. on Heya. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think there's I think there's a potential there. I really just want to add a UI to doing the broadcast, like like. You know, we have it now where basically you can you can hop into the Rails console and you can send a broadcast email to a bunch of your customers. Mm -hmm. And I've done that and that's that's fine. Dump some mark down in there, pick your recipients and you're you're off to the races. But it would be nice to have a um, just a simple old maybe you know what I was thinking is like have a have a web interface like Sidekick does. Yeah. So it's just a it's just a Sinatra app embedded in the gym and you can mount it. You know, and then we could easily mm -hmm. mount that on our on our admin app and then just have basically a text box with some markdown and have some way to query which users you want it and hit the submit button and off you go. Yeah, it would be that's that's what I want. So you should totally do that UI. This release actually also includes like a major like a scheduler change um, to the way that it the way the scheduler decides like what to send next to each user. But that change will actually enable us to, um, I think, do like a simple uh, like um, stats dashboard on like how many emails are being sent and who they're being sent to and some basic reporting, like a basic reporting dashboard, basically. So I'd like cool. to eventually, I envision having like, you know, a report, like a little reporting dashboard and then maybe some broadcast, a broadcast email section where we can schedule emails to go out. Maybe we should hire someone on Upwork to do this for us. We could. Yeah, for sure. We had a really pleasant experience with Upwork this week and hiring some Python contractors. Yeah, Although, our first bug fix released. Already, yes. Yeah. In one, in one week, like we posted the ad, it's got a, someone, got yeah. a thing. I actually, it was like within like a like 24 hours, I think, maybe. Yeah, um, super quick. He, yeah. So what did you all do? Because every time I've hired people from... Okay, first of all, first of all, a little um, a little confession. It's like when I very first started freelancing, I was a contractor on Upwork for way too little money. But I didn't know what I was doing, so it balanced out. But every time I've tried to hire somebody on Upwork, it's always kind of been disappointing. It's always kind of been just people didn't really produce good results. So what did y'all do? Like, what, what was I doing wrong? Well, you know, I create the job ad and, and, and there's this, of course, helpful little wizard that walks you through setting it up. And uh, so, so Josh had written a great description about exactly what we needed. And I just took that markdown and I dumped it into their little text box there. But one of the thing, two of the things I think that were key were one, it, it asked you a, well, a variety of questions, but two of the questions in particular were, what level of experience do you want? And so you got to choose between beginner, intermediate, and expert. And I chose expert. And it also asks you like what pay range. And when it asks you what the pay range is, it gives you a suggestion based on other jobs happening on the site right now. And so 
for this particular job, I, was, I had put in, I wanted Python. That was like the keyword, right? And I wanted someone backend development. That was another one of the tags. And it recommended, I want to say, or recommended like a range of like 30 to 50 an hour. I can't remember for sure, but it's like, here's what the typical job looks like. And you could just choose that as a, yeah, just go ahead and do that. And so I chose that. And that, I think, I think those two things just made it like expert level and then choosing a range that's basically the same range as everybody else that's doing. So yeah. I'm curious, does the, um, when you choose an expert level, does that, are people assigned like a ranking or is it self identification, self selection into the rankings? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, we got a, we got a lot of responses. I read through most of them and I will say like they were not all, they were definitely not all equal. So there were definitely some people in there that I, you know, wasn't going to hire. The first couple of people, like, cause it kind of recommends like who the best match, like it, it has some sort of algorithm that says this is the best match for you or these people are. And there was like probably two or three top, like the top ones at the very top who had, uh, already completed a, a, a lot of work on through Upwork. Like it shows the dollar amount that they've earned through Upwork too, which kind of helps you see like, um, like what their success rate is with projects. I picked one that had, uh, I, I think, you know, like 10 or $20,000 already through Upwork. Yeah. So I kind of just picked one of the candidates that it recommended to, which I don't know, maybe that makes a difference. They have some way of knowing. There was one, one little snag and that was, I did select like, you can choose, do you want to hire one person or multiple people? And if you choose multiple, you can say how many you want to hire. And I knew that Josh wanted to have some flexibility with, you know, picking people to work on a variety of tasks since we have you know, plenty of things to do. And so I chose multiple and I chose two. I was like, ah, we can't really manage more than two people right now. So let me just choose two. So Josh went ahead and picked one, hired, like you, you marked them as hired in there, but we left the job open because like we might need a second person Right. But we just haven't, we haven't picked a second person yet. Well, they have this feature in Upwork where you can send out invitations to contractors. Like you post your ad and that's one thing. So that's, you know, someone's going to find it and they might apply to it, but you can also, you know, proactively reach out to particular contractors who might not just see your ad. Right. And I think Upwork like charges for this. You get so many invitations and then you have to start paying. I, I don't know. I've never used mm. it, but. Oh, it's just like a dating site. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But they have what they call, well, I don't know what they call it. It's some sort of like assistant or some sort of specialist or something that helps you with your job ad and helps mm. you find the right candidates. And it's like, I've never, never used that. Like I can pick people, right? That's not hard. But uh, what this, in our case, what this person did was started inviting candidates and Josh had already hired person and we, you know, the job was still open, but we'd already picked the person that we started working that person. And then we started getting mm. these messages from people like, oh, thank you for inviting me to check out your job. And I'm like, I didn't do that, you know, but yeah. I realized that this, this assistant person was. And so that's not great because like, we're not actively, you know, at the moment looking for another person. We've got it covered. Thank you. So we're not going to be inviting people to, to yeah. anyway. So I contacted the Upwork guy. I'm like, Hey, look, could you stop doing that? Cause we are set. And by the way, could you set a flag on our account that we don't want this automatic invitation thing ever again. And uh, nice. I just guessed that they had that sort of setting. And they do, actually. He wrote back and he's like, oh, so sorry. Yeah, I'll turn that off for you so you won't have that anymore. Oh, cool. All right. Well, yeah, that was a win. Email them. Yeah. I'm excited about the potential for this type of, this type of work, though, um, which is basically just, it's just open source work. Like we have all these open source projects to maintain and we want to pay people to work on them. And that might be another, I mean, this is just the first success and it's still ongoing. So, you know, I mean, this whole thing could fall through still, but if this works out, like it, um, one reason could be that this is a little, I think this is different from the, the typical project that I think of Upwork is like, you have like a self-contained project that you've like specced out that you want to hand to someone and have them like deliver, you know, like an app or something or some sort of complete deliverable. And like our job at is basically like, you know what open source work looks like. You probably already contributed to an open source project if you're going to be a good fit for this job. Like here's our list of issues that you can go check out before you even apply to this job and you can see like what work is what work is available. And when we hire you, like we're just gonna literally send you to this list of issues and say, you know, do that one. And so it feels a little bit different than like, okay, I need to like build a, a I need a web app from scratch and we have to like give you, uh, we have to go through the whole planning process and 
I probably have some sort of spec document and yeah, it, it's all planned out. All the typical failures of software development apply to the, you know, that scenario versus this scenario. It's like, if you don't work out, like we're going to know, like on the first issue, probably like if you don't deliver and it's no big deal if you don't, because, you know, neither of us have really invested much at that point. So we can, you know, pick, you know, try someone else, or if you don't like it, we'll move on. Yeah. I think that's very important that it's like no big deal if it doesn't work out. Because I feel like a lot of times with our contractors in the past, like we invest a lot of energy into them and then eventually they're contractors. So they get a job or flake out or whatever. On our end, we call it flaking out, but really they have no obligation to us. Yeah, to, it makes to, sense. You know, do stuff for us. So, so yeah. So why would they, you know, just stay with us forever? You know, with a blog, it's I've benefited from a very similar attitude, right? It's like, I've got plenty of people writing blog posts. And so if this particular one doesn't work out, I don't really care. I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time on something that doesn't work out. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you contact me and you want to write a blog post and then I never hear from you again, like, that's fine. I wish you luck. You know, it's whatever. It's like casual dating versus getting engaged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, if we don't like each other, that's okay. We can go date somebody else. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's a lot less pressure and mm-hmm. I like it. And I, I really hope the Upwork thing works out because we, we talked in our conclave about, you know, sort of coming up with an in-house system for managing lots of contractors for jobs like this. And if Upwork can do it, that'll save us a lot of a lot of work. I'm kind of excited about like figuring that out now. Like I think eventually like this system i think like we could probably have a system that like allows us to work with people through upwork and allows us to work with people outside of upwork like i mean we already have a lot of the pieces like the management pieces in place like i mean for like you know we have we can like send people contractor agreements in i think like a few minutes at this point and have to you know get that all signed i've got a request for our listeners if they know like if you know if like uh it's like upwork but it's your own personal account and it's not like you're there, there's no like army of freelancers bidding on your stuff. It's just like all the back end stuff of Upwork that you can just like use on your own and put all your contractors in there and you have personal experience with this tool. Could you like tweet me like at Starhorn, S T A R R H O R N E? Cool. Cause cause if so. you don't, we might have to build that product. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> or or maybe, I might just I might just I build mean, a notion page. <laughs> I know that it exists. I know that one of the, these exists out there. I just yeah. don't know how much, how expensive they are. Just need the universe to bring it to you. Yeah, exactly. This is not, this is like the next evolution. It's not lazy webbing. It's like lazy podcasting. There you go. It's just, I say I want something. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want and while we're, while we're wishing, I want to hire a excellent VP of sales to come in and, and sell the heck out of honey badger for us. And, Totally flexible schedule, you know, can spend maybe, maybe five hours, maybe 50 hours a week. I don't care as long as like they're selling, bringing in those hot leads. That's, that's what I want. So all yeah. our audience out there, if you have a fantastic VP of sales that wants to work for us, then just, just one sitting around on the shelf. Yeah. Just, just send them our way. And if you have two, even better, send them both. There you go. <laughs> just keep the job open. Cause put on like, Upwork. <laughs> put on Upwork. Yeah, I'm going to go right now. I'm going to see if Upwork has a sales category. Um, yeah. Cause like I have no idea about how to do sales. Like I, I don't mind learning, but I think it'd probably be more effective if we probably had someone who actually knew what they were doing, doing that. And I definitely want to do some outbound sales for Honey Badger. I want us to be like boiler room calling, you know, everyone <laughs> on the planet, like you should buy Honey Badger because we're awesome. You know? Coffees for closers. I imagine we might also be interested in if there are people out there who just know about this and just want to talk to us and possibly earn a consulting fee, we might be interested in that too. For sure. So you're saying this is the year that we figure out sales? This is the year we figure out sales. Yes. Yeah. We're ready. We're ready for it. We're ready. I'm, I'm not ready for say, the next level. I, don't, I, don't, I know you are. Yeah. I'm not going to say or die trying because... <laughs> Because we're not going to. We're not going to die trying. Not, yeah. that, no. we're, we're we're going to we're going to do this very conservatively. <laughs> and, and, and if it doesn't and, work out, that's okay. Because <laughs> we still have plenty of revenue. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've got one idea for y'all for like the next level. Okay. One word: options. <laughs> do you see? Are we going to option our future? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> see that? No, I got. <laughs> oh, Jimmy went down to fifty yesterday. <laughs> 
Oh. It did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have no uh, desire to buy GME. Like I've been, I've been following it a little bit, yeah. and like some people are like, like some people are predicting that like th there's going to be this lull and then it's going to go back up, and that's probably bullshit. That's probably completely <laughs> yeah. wrong. But like, part of me is just like, hmm, I wonder like if I spent like a hundred dollars on call options, you could probably buy call options for like a thousand shares of GME for a hundred dollars for like six months from now. And, you know, just like, just like to have a little money in the game. Yeah. If you really, really want to get into gambling on the stock market, call options are the way to go. As opposed to just buying a stock and hoping it goes yeah. up, right? Because you can get much more leverage from the call options than you can just from buying and holding. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal today that was like teenagers are betting their, all of their savings on GME and parents are worried. <laughs> I like to look for the, the silver lining. And my, so in this case, I think perhaps just maybe like a lot of teens and millennials will get introduced to the stock market through this and, and maybe mm -hmm. stick around and, and become like savvy investors. And, you, and, know, you know, yeah, you're right. You're actually right. Like I think to experience like to, to really like experience the stock market, you have to lose money at some point. Like, I mean, I, I think you have to, like, you're going to make some mistakes. And, uh, it's probably better to make some mistakes in your, like some dumb mistakes in your teens versus like when you're older and have more money saved to lose and, and all that. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess there's, there are some investors who just, you know, their entire investing career is just perfect, uh, perfect record. <laughs> They've never, ever made a bad trade, but you know, they say about monkeys and typewriters <laughs> <laughs> indeed. All of this has made me sort of realize that, you know, I need to, I don't know, my, my whole approach to investing has always just been like dump everything into a Vanguard index fund. And I think that's still correct for like, you know, most inv my investing, but I was like, maybe I need to have like a sort of a strat, like a portfolio where it's like 80% in the like mutual funds, like 20% or, you know, 15% is like medium risk stocks and then five percent is like more high risk type things because i realized that i have no desire to like spend all my money on on risky investments but it's like well like if i have like almost no risky investments like maybe i'm losing out on upside i don't know yeah, yeah my my strategy has been like Somewhere in the high nineties percent of my of my investing is just index funds, you know, or or four one k, which is split with some bonds and things like that. Just boring, you know, just put the money in and forget about it, kind of thing. But then I always like to keep aside a little bucket of basically I consider it play money, but it's to make those individual bets. Like when I bought Apple stock in two thousand, right, and that turned out to be a very good thing after twenty years. So like I, I like doing that and just like. Well, the way I look at it is like this money is, if it all goes to zero, I won't miss it, right? But if it, it could turn into something and I'm, I'm going to make a bet on a, a particular stock, like, I don't know, a while back I bought Shopify and that worked out really well. I mean, I bought some Amazon and that's worked out really well. You know, so things that I know and I'm like, yeah, I think that's a good company. Then I will buy a little bit of it, right? And then uh, mm -hmm. just sit on it for a while. And yeah, it's been, it's been fine. Like it's been fun. And then I can, I can play like I know what I'm doing, right? But not risk all my, all my savings. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've been watching a lot of people do like the fractional trading thing on Twitter and like, you know, they're like investing tiny amounts of money, but into a portfolio like that would be, you know, basically you're like, like, it seems like practice, like it's a way to practice, you know, making trades and investing without like risking, you know, having to buy, like spend hundreds of dollars on, on a share or whatever. Yeah. One thing all this has taught me this whole like GME thing and just sort of, I'm, I'm not involved. I just have been sort of following along at home is that pretty much everyone who talks about stocks on the internet just has no idea what they're talking about mm -hmm. and yet speaks with the most absolute certainty that they know everything about what they're talking about. And so I, I'm just less left. I'm left with a profound distrust of everyone <laughs> of everything. Well, that's well, you welcome to the, welcome to the club. <laughs> of the, welcome to the 21st century. There we go. <laughs> since, since we just happen to be three people on the internet that know nothing about socks. And about anyway. <laughs> there you go. With the, yeah. With a podcast. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh yeah, but my but my yeah. <laughs> but um yeah everything i say is is like riddled through with a profound like uncertainty so i'm not yeah i don't i don't know what i'm talking about yeah. this is not financial advice please consult the lawyer yeah i thought the stock market was going to tank when um For when real. the economy collapsed i thought that the economy collapsing would cause the stock market to get to go down but it didn't shocker it didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, okay, Benjamin Graham. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Value Investing. Like, where were you? Where were you in March, Benjamin Graham? <laughs> this is not how it's supposed to work. Anyway, that's just... Yeah. I don't, uh, yeah. Well, it's detached. The, it's detached from the economy. By the way, Upwork does have categories for sales. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know how well that worked out, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, that could be... That could be truly horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think the one snag that we have, like we couldn't just hire someone off the street because like developers don't like to be marketed to in the typical ways. Like they do not want to answer their phones to people saying, hey, you should buy this thing, right? They don't want to get spam in their inbox and things like that. So it would be, I think you'd have to find someone that's willing to put in a little extra effort beyond just the dialing for dollars, right? Yeah, I wonder I wonder how much technical knowledge the person I ne will need because like it's a pretty technical product. Yeah, I would say probably not a lot because for example, on any in-depth sales call, like I would be on the call as the technical sales yeah. person. So I would be their support, right? And I imagine they're not initially like are they reaching they're not like are they reaching out to like engineering well, lead or i mean are they reaching out to like executive like more the executive level or project management type anyway so like yeah yeah like how technical it, is the is the lead like the right. first you know until they bring in their technical people to like evaluate be like hey you know would this be useful to us right yeah i'd imagine the first the first outreach is just like hey you know you should probably be monitoring your apps you know and yeah. Uh, let's talk about that, right? And I have no idea how any of, like, I I have no experience with this, and I, this is what I want to learn uh, more about. But yes. I, I want to, you always want to leave open the possibility that you have no idea how this actually works. And <laughs> this is why we need someone to come and tell us for money. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, but like honor system, you can't just uh, scam us. <laughs> <laughs> Cause we have just values. come and tell us what we want to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cash is on the table. Yeah. So it's going to be a good year. Well, you have been listening to founder quest. Yeah. Review us on Apple podcasts. We're always looking for writers um, for our blog, honeybadger.io forward slash blog. Go look for the right for us page. I actually have a little bit of a backlog right now, so it may take a little, a little time before I can um, talk with you, but you know, I won't forget you because, you know, I love each and every one of you. So I will let you all go. Also, don't forget to buy GME so that uh, stars off. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Diamond hands. Diamond hands. Diamond hands. <laughs> Founder Quest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360 degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word, where you can access our huge back catalog of episodes. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.